Hello, I'm Cathy Pearce, curator at Guildhall Art Gallery, and I'm going to take you round our new exhibition, The Enchanted Interior. This exhibition is a feast for the eyes uh, and very thought provoking, and we're going to go through it section by section, picking out a few highlight works along the way. This exhibition has been brought together by Lane Art Gallery Newcastle and adapted for the Guildhall. We've added some more of our permanent collection works into the display. The show explores 19th century depictions of women trapped in highly decorated interiors, often with sinister undertones, and how contemporary women artists have subverted this theme. Above all, the exhibition puts women's art at the forefront. Our first section is called Captivating Beauty and it looks at classic examples of mid to late Victorian art tastes. This covers a range of styles but primarily uh, with a focus on Orientalism. What the works in this section have in common is that they all feature women as the chief ornament of a highly decorative space. They also look at uh, Orientalism and by that term we mean Western artists producing images of the so-called exotic East for a European audience but fetishising the culture of the Middle East and North Africa. This style of painting was produced for Victorian buyers who wanted to adorn their homes with beautiful objects. Their own enchanted interiors at home would be decorated with images of enchanted interiors. In Whistler's painting of 1868, Three Figures Pink and Grey, we see how the artist is influenced by Japanese prints. Whistler is less interested in the female figures as individuals and more as a conveyor of tone and mood. They're very much meant to be carriers for his palette. So the pink and grey and the slightly sort of orange tones that you see coming out in the headpieces are meant to um, come together to create an aesthetic sensory experience. This painting is not about women as women, as individuals. It is about using them as decorative objects. This section is called the gilded cage. Now that term is used as a metaphor to describe in real life how women have historically made matrimonial contracts and in the past lost their independence and wealth to their husbands. Art picks up this motif and in the Victorian period you see many references to women who are imprisoned or entrapped or having their freedoms limited in some way. Now this painting is called The Gilded Cage and it is by a Victorian female artist, Evelyn de Morgan. She is a sort of second wave pre-Raphaelite artist working around the same time as Burne Jones. What's interesting about her is that she is at the forefront of a kind of feminist movement before that phrase really exists. Um, she is from a non-conformist tradition, she's a pacifist, a spiritualist, and she does not believe in the yoke of marriage. In fact, she marries someone who she collaborates with creatively and they form an equal working partnership. In this painting we see an attempt to describe the entrapment um, within a marriage and how the woman might want to escape. It also contains within it a literal gilded cage with a bird trapped within it. Now this is the male figure and he is sort of passively looking away. His wife is desperate to get out the window and join the pageantry and revelry going on outside. We see how she has discarded her jewellery and the signs of luxury and material wealth that perhaps she has, uh, that have kept her comfortable um, and yet limited her. And we see her book has been abandoned. So there is a tension between education and independence and learning um, and material comforts, which may be appealing, but are limited and um, unable to endure. In our next section, Disturbing Stories, we go beneath the surface of the enchanted interior to explore some more sinister themes. And one story in particular that recurs, especially in painting, is The Lady of Shalott, taken from Tennyson's poems Idylls of the King, themselves based on Arthurian legend. The Lady of Shalott is trapped in a tower and she is condemned never to look directly onto the real world, but to only see it through the reflections of a mirror. She lives under a mysterious curse. This is an oil study by John William Waterhouse of the Lady of Shalott and we can see that it's, it shows a lot of the artist's technique so you get a sense of the movement of his brush strokes. The, the face is finished but everything else is kind of in motion and coming together for his final painting. There are parallels in the Lady of Shalott story with the everyday experience of Victorian women in that they are confined to domestic space. Private space is considered the realm of the female and public space is considered the appropriate space for men. So many women are in their towers, in their 
confined spaces, looking out onto the world but unable to participate in it. Contemporary women artists can make explicit what the Victorians could only imply, and Maisie Broadhead's piece, Shackled, from her series Pearls, uh, starts to bring women out of the frame. The woman is shot in the manner of 18th century portraiture, but what's made very obvious is her entrapment. The string of pearls, the sign of luxury and material wealth, is in fact a set of handcuffs. Not only that, the handcuffs extend down onto the floor and, and are weighted to the ground. This section is called Intoxicating Homes and it brings together items that you might find in a 19th century home. For example, wallpaper based on Sleeping Beauty by Walter Crane and a birdcage which once belonged to the artist Alma Tadema and was also owned, we know, by George Frampton. This piano was given to the artist Edward Byrne-Jones by his aunt as a wedding present and it was undecorated at the point at which he received it. However, he painted on it and we might wonder what this tells us about his attitude towards women or about the depiction of women on items of domestic furniture. Well, for a wedding present, the scenes of these women here aren't particularly celebratory. In fact, what we see on there looks suspiciously like a grim reaper. And these women are all in various attitudes of soporific effect um, or possibly despair. We know that Burne Jones had a somewhat problematic relationship with women and possibly even with marriage he was known to have said women should all be locked up. This next section is called Becoming Objects. We've seen interiors that act on their inhabitants in entrancing and intoxicating ways, but another form of enchantment to provide inspiration for artists is that by which an inanimate object may be brought to life or a living being might be made inanimate. The works here make literal the association of women with objects, but not necessarily for the purpose of objectifying them. This mesmeric sculpture depicts the mythic figure Lamia from a Keats poem of 1820. She is a tragic, half-serpent creature who assumes female form to win the love of a mortal man, but vanishes when her true nature is revealed on their wedding day. In Frampton's uncanny sculpture, unusual materials are used to add symbolic meaning. She's made of bronze, opals and ivory. Now she looks, I think, completely modern and I think you'd be hard pressed to attribute her to the 19th century. She was made in 1900 and when she was exhibited at the Royal Academy she was said to have created an absolute silence in the room and I think she still has that effect today. She very much sits at the threshold of uh, history and modernity and I think we can look at her as something of a steampunk or some sort of um, contemporary response to the Victorian works that we've already seen but she is in fact a timeless piece. So we have looked at the languid beauties trapped in domestic spaces, passive, objectified, perhaps beautiful but static. We are now going to look at something a little bit more visceral, a little bit more psychologically intense. This next section is called Experiencing Enclosure and starts to look at the embodied experience of women trapped in enclosed space. Although this looks like an unassuming metal grill, it is in fact part of an installation created by American artist Shana Lutka, and it contains within it a world of meaning. Her work looks at psychoanalysis and surrealism, and this is based on a series of visits she made to Salpetria Hospital in France, which was the site of hysteria studies. When she visited the hospital and saw the cells that the women were kept in, some as young as 14, she noticed that although there was very little in them, what there was were little metal grills in the skirting boards which connected through to the adjoining cell. And these suggested to her a crack of light and air and perhaps a means of communication where the women could exchange information or talk or deal with their situation. Our next section looks at presence and absence and the idea of the psychological interior which takes on the characteristics of the human realities within it. So you will see images of empty rooms and also rooms where the female presence is a ghostly one. Now this huge installation is by Iraqi artist Have Karaman and what she has done is create a kind of bird's eye view layout of an Iraqi home. 
It's influenced by the childhood home in Baghdad, which she fled from as a refugee of the Iran-Iraq war. But what she does is embody it with a version of herself ghosting through the rooms. This pattern here represents the screen that segregates the sexes in the traditional Iraqi home. And she configures it as an opportunity as well as a limitation. So the women who are kept behind the screen are nevertheless able to eavesdrop into the world of men to perhaps pick up information and pass it back to each other. So it represents a threshold between empowerment and disempowerment in a way that's perhaps more complex than we might initially understand. Our final section brings us back to the pre-Raphaelite and the idea of resisting enchantment. And as we've seen, contemporary artists reframe this idea repeatedly throughout the show. The work behind me, Las Veneris by Edward Byrne Jones, takes a look at a sumptuous, if supine, Venus trapped in her court as her lover abandoned her. This section looks at the idea of the enchantress and the limits of her power. But let's give the final word to Victorian female artist, Evelyn de Morgan. This painting from 1903 was originally misattributed as being about a witch. And if we look closer at the symbols in the painting, we see that that is far from being the case, although she does have a lovely black cat familiar down here. I think when we look at the philosophical texts on her shelf, uh, at the fact she is mixing some sort of love potion, and that indeed is the title of the painting, she is a benevolent alchemist. She's certainly an educated woman and using her powers for good. And in this image, the enchanted interior is not a place of imprisonment, but one of independence. This is a working space, and it belongs to the enchantress or alchemist who is using her power to help other people. So far from being trapped, this woman is exercising her freedom within a space that is hers. This is not a scene of supine enchantment, but of empowerment. Mm -hmm.